Gamified spreadsheets, also known as city builders, are one of my favorite genres of video games and I've played a fair few of them over the past 30 years. So here's my take on the city building iceberg, starting obviously with the above water area, where you'll find either newer titles that are popular with mainly younger players who are just starting out with their first title or much older games that have appealed to both hardcore city building players as well as more casual ones who have maybe played one or two titles and the genre never clicked for them. SimCity 2000 simply has to be at the tippity top of this iceberg. Released in 1993, SimCity 2000 has acted as the introduction to the city building genre for many a generation. Its presence on a plethora of non-desktop platforms means that it will be familiar to a generous proportion of console gamers out there as well. You could have played it on the SNES, Sega Saturn, PlayStation, Nintendo 64, Game Boy Advance and even on Windows Mobile if you were crazy enough to purchase a gadget that used that. The game itself is quite possibly the quintessential city building experience in which you are tasked with planning and managing increasingly larger modern day urban sprawls, dealing with everything from electricity generation and distribution to taxes, with the desired result being to increase your population standard of living. It was the second in a long series of similarly titled games and likewise part of a much larger and diverse sim prefixed universe. But inarguably, it's likely the one that will pop up in most people's minds. Caesar 3 is likewise one of those most classic of city building titles that acted as the first foray into the genre for many. As the name implies, it will put you in the sandals of a Roman Empire official and your job will mainly revolve around building ancient Roman cities to increasingly more difficult specs. The meta gameplay innovation Caesar 3 created was the idea of optimizing the arrangement of various housing and service buildings within individual blocks, which would take advantage of the game's weird walker system. Each person you see in the game will go about their daily business, going to get water, food, entertainment, what have you, with the unique quirk, let's say, of whenever meeting an intersection in the road, choosing a random direction to go into. And that makes about as much sense as you think it should, but it is the underpinning system the game is built on, so players have developed strategies to take it into account. The Roman gods are also of particular note seeing as how they must be appeased by building temples dedicated to each of them and throwing feasts in order to avoid their wrath. The game also has a sort of optional combat component, meaning that you can usually choose between a more combat oriented mission or a more city building heavy mission. Settlers 3 could be considered the counterpart to Caesar 3. Having been released in the same year, it takes a more RTS styled approach to the game, basically zooming in on smaller settlements with much more 3D looking and vibrant graphics, all of which ending with you having to defeat the other factions on the map. A fair bit repetitive, to tell you the truth, and very much down to trial and error map exploration. Once you fail the mission a couple of times, you'll know in which direction you should expand in order to gain access to the resources required for you to build an army and go conquering. Combat, interestingly enough, while real time is very automated. You have access to only the most basic of orders and then you basically have to let your soldiers go about their walking and attacking animations. You do have to keep an eye on them because their AI is very dumb and can be easily attracted into fights it cannot win which you can likewise use to your advantage when dealing with the computer enemies. Even so, combat is pretty slow and you will usually require both a blend of different types of units to win as well as several waves of them to do so. Pharaoh is the sequel to Caesar 3 within the overall Impressions Game City Building series of games and does much of the same things but with a fair bit of improvements and switching the setting to ancient Egypt. There are several unique things that make Pharaoh stand out. The first being its actual visual aesthetic. Not only is everything deeply thematic from a color use standpoint, but the level of detail in the design of buildings is superior to its predecessor. And the user interface is illustrated in a hieroglyph style. On the mechanic side, you couldn't really have a game set in ancient Egypt without featuring its most important aspect, the Nile, and especially its yearly flooding. This creates the feature of the floodplains, where you can plant your many different types of crops and likewise allows for the introduction of irrigation canals. 
The other major mechanic addition is the focus on building increasingly grander monuments, going in chronological order throughout the history of ancient Egypt, starting with small mastabas or mastabas and ending with gigantic pyramids. This game also has a combat component much like Caesar 3 and it is treated pretty much similarly with the addition of naval combat. City Skylines is kind of the contemporary equivalent of SimCity 2000 in terms of its popularity and appeal. It is likewise set in the modern day, but it takes advantage of current day computing possibilities and allows for the rough simulation of daily behavior for up to 1 million unique citizens, which would in turn bleed into generating realistic traffic issues as well as other domino style effects on districts and services. Being published by Paradox also means the game has had an almost obscene amount of expansions in DLC and most importantly, it has a sequel scheduled for release in 2023. Banished is in my mind the indie city building title that pretty much single-handedly sparked the resurrection of the entire genre. Released in 2014, it stayed relatively underground for some time after release but Thanks to its modding community, it grew in awareness and importance in the indie scene and managed to poke into the mainstream here and there. The game itself is based around creating a settlement in harsh and remote areas where the number of people is your main resource and keeping them happy and alive are your goals. The base game benefits from focusing on not only the survival aspect, in winter especially, but also on the idea of sustainable growth. Even though I have an issue with its lack of visual theme as well as it not offering any sort of overall sense of progression, the way in which I would play it would be to go for all the crazy achievements it has. Of course, the modding community came in and filled the gaps and turned the game into so much more than it was initially. But what I want to say is that even the vanilla experience is very on point and I also credit Banished with rekindling my love for the city building genre. Anno 1800 is here mainly due to it being the most recent Anno title to be released and as such it has a temporary place on top of the iceberg. In terms of actual community popularity, the next Anno title is the one that takes the win. But it is notable for being a city building game released by a major publisher even if said publisher is one I heavily dislike and the game brings in some mechanical improvements over its predecessors in the form of the blueprint mode which allows you to plan your city and use placeholder buildings in areas where you'll want said buildings to be built later on. Unfortunately, since it is a game released by a major publisher well known for their greediness, this means it features a yearly amount of 3 DLCs most of which add further mechanics and functionality to the base game. And this is where the top of the iceberg ends and we start going under the water, into the more intermediate area where you'll find most city builder fans. Frostpunk is quite the revelation in terms of hardcore survival city building. Featuring a very strong visual and narrative theme, Frostpunk focuses not on growth but on survival, in a fictional and extreme environment where the main crux of the game revolves around the ethical decisions you will make while constructing a human society whose main goal is to outlast a catastrophic cold snap that has engulfed the planet. How much of the old world morals and principles can be maintained when the extinction of the entire species could depend on the survival of your one settlement? It is a dark subject matter, but one that makes for a very compelling setting. One which will be further expanded upon in the sequel that was announced in 2021. Surviving Mars is yet another Paradox published survival city builder set, as you might infer from the name, on Mars. The special feature this game touts is the use of actual Martian surface maps in the creation of the game maps you will be building a colony on as accurate an approximation of the various red planet areas that exist. It's a pretty cool and involved game with a relatively mild survival challenge on its default difficulty setting. Its survival components are mainly focused on creating a constant supply of much needed parts needed to maintain the constantly degrading infrastructure you build. That Martian dust gets everywhere. The base game is pretty cool but it does get better with the subsequent expansions as per Paradox Tradition and Business Model. The most thematically needed of them being, in my opinion, the Green Planet expansion which allows you to terraform the planet. Because honestly, why colonize Mars if you can't eventually terraform it? Anno 1404 simply is the most appreciated of the Anno historic titles, at least. 
Being the fourth game of the series, chronologically, it builds on the mechanics and engine of the past titles, while adding new buildings, resources, items and other interaction options. From a visual standpoint, it borrows the engine from the previous title, but adding new oriental desert islands with specific buildings make for a great visual and thematic addition. The islands are also much larger than in the past title and can feature more resources. Players now being able to plant seeds on certain islands to create a source of much needed raw materials. I didn't find the campaign to be as interesting as I had hoped, but the game has a very active modding community and is very much alive and kicking. Zeus, Master of Olympus, is possibly the last quasi mainstream impression city building game, oftentimes being overlooked as quote unquote the one after Pharaoh. Set in ancient Greece this time, the first improvement it brings to the recipe is in the arrangement of the user interface, which is more organized and allows for quicker access to important information with fewer clicks than in Pharaoh. The game animations are quite impressive, even by impression standards. However, the unique art style, characterized by exaggerated and stylized proportions, most likely turned many players away. Another thing that it does quite differently from prior titles in the series is how you interact with the gods having them manifest physically within your city for the first time ever. Usually you need them to go on various missions, taken straight out of ancient Greek mythology. The game also features combat, however, it has the important option of bribing the attacking armies to leave you alone, which count as victories, thus allowing you to finish missions that imply combat if you have a strong enough income. Black and White is technically a god game. But these games are sometimes described as city builders seeing as how usually building and managing a settlement is a big part of their gameplay loop. This title doesn't differ in that respect, your overarching goal being to keep your populace fed, happy and more importantly worshipping you. The game pushed the possibilities of personal computers of the time, both from the perspective of its 3D graphics as well as from the perspective of simulating artificial life. You play as a newly formed deity and interact with the world directly via your giant hand. The game features a mouse gesture system so as to work with the hand concept but by far the most important and memorable concept that the game brought is the creature avatar mechanic. Your creature avatar is your indirect way of interacting with the game world. The creature being endowed with an AI capable of learning from observing the player's actions as well as from how the player interacts with it. The game gets increasingly more difficult, with many settlements to manage and different challenges to deal with, so properly training your creature to work for you is extremely important. Emperor Rise of the Middle Kingdom is arguably the least appreciated of the Impression City Builder titles and it's such a pity because the game is in my opinion peak Impressions games. Emperor features the smoothest gameplay of the entire series and the most quality of life features, basically taking all the best parts of the previous titles and incorporating them into the theme and setting of ancient China. Aesthetically speaking, the game returns to a realistic art style, and thematic mechanics include not only the presence of walls, which allow an even more granular control of who goes in and out of your blocks, but also the layering in of a feng shui mechanic on top of the usual neighborhood appeal system. The gods work similarly to how they do in Zeus, but the farms work differently by allowing you to plant different crops at the same time around one farm building. The game is mechanically and objectively superior to its predecessors, but it is likely the least played of the major titles in the Impression City Builder series. Settlers 2 is arguably the reason why the Settlers series has existed for as long as it has. Because when it came out in 1996, it managed to not only appeal to players of the original title, but it also massively expanded the audience for city building games despite the game's difficulty curve. The visual style is something that likely had a lot to do with this appeal because it can still amaze on the one hand and relax on the other. Every pixel is carefully placed, creating charming little townspeople going to and from the many buildings and adorable pixel art ducks waddling around the countryside. The graphics possess a certain simple charm that can only truly be found in that era. Obviously the game features resource gathering, processing as well as combat but arguably its most important mechanic is the flag system, which you both use for road construction as well as a sort of relay system for goods distribution. The more flags are set on any given road, the more settlers will be used in the relay system and make transportation of goods smoother. 
but you can only set flags at certain distances from each other and constantly reorganizing your road network will be a continued endeavor as your settlement grows and priorities shift towards growing an army. Anno 1701 doesn't look as detailed as Anno 1404, but it features a very different engine than its predecessors, being the first 3D engine Anno game. Its visual style is grounded in reality. However, the design of most everything in it is stylized, coupled with the use of bright colors and expressive animations. Playing it from a modern perspective, what most stands out is the absolutely stupendous Sunken Dragon campaign. Thanks to its non-standard missions and narrative that truly make the player feel engaged with the story and the events that we are participating in. On the mechanic side of things, island exploration and creating naval logistics changes is one of the major focal points, especially as you grow into the late early game, alongside the management of your budget through careful taxation and watching your expenses. Immortal Cities, Children of the Nile, while it isn't technically an impressions game, it was made by many developers who used to work there. Just like the name implies, the game is set in ancient Egypt, where your job is to generate sufficient food, bricks and several other resources in order to build increasingly more grandiose projects in order to boost your city's prestige. This is the underlying goal for this first historic city building game rendered in a 3D engine. Since it was released back in 2004, this means the graphics are quite blocky, but the details and building animations are simply captivating. Buildings having several construction steps and watching the people going about their day is quite fascinating as well. The game also does a good job at reflecting ancient Egypt's stratified and religiously focused society featuring separate buildings that cater to commoners or nobles, with different tiers of buildings and workers catering to different social strata. The gameplay is fairly challenging, but if you are enthralled by the game, following the tutorials and maybe looking for some beginner tips and tricks will answer most of your questions. Anno 1503 is the second game in the Anno series and it is highly interesting to look at because the jump in visual detail from the first game is quite noticeable. Despite these top-notch sprites, the buildings start to become harder to tell apart once they start evolving, but it's usually down to how much time you spend in the game. After some time, you get accustomed to them. The row system in the game is hugely important, especially because each building has several but particular access points that can connect to roads. Simply touching a building on a side with a road will not automatically make it part of the system. And that can prove to be a bit weird for most players accustomed to the impressions games for instance. Also weird might be the clip art style user interface, featuring very illustrative buttons that just didn't need to be that way but are possibly a product of their time's screen resolutions. Tropico. While not exactly a city builder per se, does concern itself with building and managing a community. In this case, a banana republic during the Cold War and puts the player in the shoes of El Presidente. But as opposed to most other games on this list, the overarching goal of the game is to stay in power. Regardless of any other victory condition, none of them can be achieved if you're not in charge of the island. You can do this through various means, either doing it through free elections, trying to shift the odds in your favor, or going full out dictator. Each of these choices will affect your people's happiness and respect for you, as well as the various political factions within. There are many things that can go wrong during your tenure as ruler, from upsetting the two superpowers to enraging the local populace that start staging guerrilla attacks to your own army staging a coup. Caesar 2 is one title that will only really be familiar to those who either really love city building games or particularly care for the Caesar series especially. I feel it suffers from what I call the Heroes of Might and Magic effect, where in that case most people got introduced to the series with the second game, while in the case of Caesar most people got introduced to the series with the third one. Caesar 2 being maybe a bit too technologically lacking to be worth looking into for most. But I am not most, so I did play a fair bit of it, especially in the years when I couldn't run Caesar 3. And it's as solid an experience as you might expect from the series, but adjusted to 1995 graphical and processing standards and quite different from its sequel. There is no walker system for one, availability of services being down to distance from a building, then there's the province map where you can build mines, farms and other large scale production buildings as well as the roads to connect all of them together. 
and this is where we're going deeper into the frigid waters around this city building iceberg. Workers and Resources, Soviet Republic. Might sound a bit more familiar to some of you because of the well reported issues they had at the start of 2023. It is part city builder, part tycoon game, set in a Soviet country and it does a very good job at replicating the brutalist architecture and overall look and feel of what many Soviet countries were like before and sometimes even after the Iron Curtain fell. It features several separate simulation systems which you can turn on or off depending on the level of difficulty you're looking for and it also offers a very granular control over everything else present in the game including your citizens. While its appeal is definitely targeted at those who grew up in countries that used to be behind the Iron Curtain, it can also be a super interesting experience for those in the West. Foundation is one of the more ambitious and massive indie kickstarted projects that came with the renaissance of city builders from the second half of the 2010s. The game is built around the philosophy of organic growth, doing away with the more traditional grid pattern approach that most city building games employ. It not only allows you to place buildings in any direction, but you can also customize several of the major buildings in your settlement. And as such, you can have a lot of fun with weird and funky designs. Pathways are generated by the movement of your people, and housing is automatically built if there is need for it, the resources exist, and if there's enough space assigned for it. Assigning specific activity areas is the first phase of strategy and organization that you put into your settlement, and you can change these at all times. Besides the usual city building, there's also faction reputation, settlement splendor ratings, and the need to promote your citizens to higher status levels in order to occupy newly unlocked jobs. The game is still very much worked on and constantly updated and just a generally relaxed and chillaxy experience. Knights and Merchants is still one of the city builders I find visually striking even today thanks to its incredibly detailed sprite work, animations and sound design. It is unfortunate it lacks a fair few modern quality of life features and it is a bit of a bait and switch, luring you in with the city building for the first few missions and then revealing how much of a combat oriented experience it actually is. And I'm simply not a big fan of combat in city builders. That said, troop movement and use in knights and merchants while fairly sluggish can be rather tactical and having the right army blend to combat that of the enemy as well as using them correctly will lead to some challenging and interesting battles. This is still the only game to my knowledge that has you literally feed your army on a one to one basis, meaning that you need one serf to feed one soldier. And the farther away your troops are, the longer it will take for the food to reach them, so producing enough food to feed your troops and army of serfs is only the first part of you actually going to war. There's a fan remake that allows for the game to be more easily playable on modern platforms, so look for KAM Remake if you're interested in experiencing the game. Anno 1602 is the progenitor of the entire Anno series. Known as 1602 AD in North America, the game was released in 1998 and this means its graphics aren't exactly appealing to modern eyes, more used to realistic 3D graphics, but there is something deeply endearing about their simplicity and how much they convey with very little. From a mechanic standpoint, there are a few things worth mentioning. For one, Roads are not important in Anno 1602, but you still have to pay attention to where you place them. Then there is the rather amusing fact that zooming in and out is hotkey to the F number keys, since scroll wheels were still rather new back then. Otherwise, despite the overall simplicity of the visuals, the game's mechanics are still solid and create a great foundation for what would become a popular series within the city building community, even though it does contain combat. Ostriv is set in a fictional version of 18th century Ukraine and as opposed to most other city building titles in this video, aims to abstract very little. The game is focused on realism and historical accuracy and as such is still very much a work in progress since the level of detail and granularity it goes into relating to producing goods from raw materials is quite vast. While it does feature survival type challenges, Related to things like weather, craft failures and economy problems, these are treated with attention more towards historical accuracy as opposed to a gameplay focused one. Afterlife is a god game slash city builder from 1996 where you are a deity in charge of building functional heaven and hell experiences designed to either reward or punish the souls of non-human mortal creatures from an earth-like unnamed planet. 
You build both heaven and hell at the same time and you need to make sure you lose as few souls as possible along the way. This means both need special gates, roads and fate structures in order to function. The souls go to one of the seven types of structures corresponding to the seven virtues for heaven and the seven deadly sins for hell. But who actually works and maintains all of these institutions? Well, angels and demons of course, who act as your employees and cost money. Truth be told, the game has a really steep learning curve and you need to either read the manual or look up some beginner tips and tricks on the net to get a better sense of how the low level mechanics work because you will need to finesse and massage things down to quite a granular level in order to optimize your results. While there's no real way of technically winning the game, there are several ways to lose. And in that respect, Afterlife is akin to a prolonged Kobayashi Maru type exercise, meant to train and test your problem solving capacity, not actually succeed with an end goal. Nebuchadnezzar is an homage and spiritual successor to the classic isometric impression city building titles like Caesar 3 and Pharaoh, with the important mention that it substantially improves on the gameplay systems of those titles by removing the walker system and replacing it with the ability of manually creating routes for your various market workers and service providers. The main gameplay loop is based on creating functional logistics chains, balancing out several overlapping requirements and limitations to reach your mission objectives. That's basically what all city builders are, but the differentiation comes in when it comes to how it is executed. And in Nebuchadnezzar, setting up caravanserais and warehouses to shift goods around is very intuitive and just simply a pleasure. The amount of control we have over all the aspects of production, storage and distribution is what makes the game a pleasure to play. Its art style is what makes the game a pleasure to watch, since modern computing capabilities allow for a lot of zooming in to happen so you can enjoy the fun animations and the cool design and colors of the buildings. The game is still being worked on and big patches and updates have happened since release. Emir or Emir is an ambitious and ongoing project of not just city building but also grand scale forex strategy featuring market economy and social simulations as well as technology evolution and some combat if diplomacy fails. The multiplayer aspect of this game is likewise a major feature, but what can truly interest you in it is that your citizens are actually a species of pig people, wearing clothes and everything. Reminding me at least of that episode from the Mask cartoon where he travels to the future and Earth is populated by anthropomorphic pigs. Imagine Earth is a colony sim game that works on a planetary level and initially looks like a 4x but just a little bit off because it does so on a triangle grid. But don't let yourself be fooled, the mechanics are very much in the vein of the city building genre. What the game aims to do conceptually is to explore the impact of industrial development and progress on the natural environment through the lens of fictional alien planets. The triangle grid really does set it apart from most other civ builders and 4x's and its focus on balancing the trade-off between lucrative but environmentally harmful technologies and less lucrative but environmentally conscious ones and how either of these affect your population and the planet around them likewise makes the game a more particular experience. There is a corpo capitalist backdrop to the entire thing so all of these have to be done while keeping an eye on finances. Cultures is a city building RTS very much reminiscent of Settlers 3 but even more zoomed in both literally as well as figuratively. Cultures has you take over a group of vikings as they explore the newly found lands of Vinland situated in the northern part of North America. The graphics look very colorful and vibrant allowing you to see quite a lot of detail on your various vikings as you set them to build homes, roads and many other production buildings. This detail extends to deciding on each viking's job in particular as well as their spouse and this is where it gets weird as well as the gender of their offspring. I can see how this makes a lot of sense from a gameplay point of view especially if the game was designed with this feature in mind but really breaks the immersion for yours truly. The game does also feature combat but it's a bit more weird of a choice because all your people have names and you kinda tend to them growing up and you just don't get the sense of the game needing any sort of violence in it, considering the really bright and friendly looking art style. Constructor is one of the more particular sort of city building titles, because you could kinda argue it's more of a tycoon or simulation game, since it is built around you creating businesses. 
but these businesses are meant to build houses for tenants that will pay you rent within an urban setting set sometimes in the 1960s, I think, because it features gangsters and hippies at the same time. Anyway, the game also has a type of combat as well and it is notoriously difficult. Don't say I didn't warn you. Kingdoms and Castles is a medieval themed strategy and city building game that features a very simplified and friendly visual style and it's also very good about introducing you to the various buildings and mechanics as you play. The game does include some amount of combat but there is also a fair bit of wall and defensive tower construction as well so you could also approach the game from a light castle sim perspective. Overall it offers a relatively simple but enjoyable gameplay experience which I feel makes the game a great entry level city builder for beginner or younger players. Against the Storm is a survival city building game with a roguelike twist. In this world of perpetual rain, every few seasons or so, there's a great event which sees all of your previous progress destroyed and has you restart. But with the unlocked buildings and various global upgrades you bought in the past. During any given mission, you'll have three different species in your settlement each of them having their own very particular requirements for happiness and obviously different pluses and minuses when it comes to producing or using resources. This game is still in early access as of the making of this video but it has the potential to steadily rise up through the various layers of the iceberg. Kingdoms Reborn builds upon the foundation laid by Banished, offering a more sophisticated city building experience with enhanced gameplay mechanics, expanded features and a more visually thematic world. While this isn't the only Banished inspired game to introduce a technology tree, Kingdom Reborn's offer is quite complex and multi-layered, offering players the ability to research and unlock new technologies that impact various aspects of your kingdom, from agriculture to infrastructure to military advancements. The game also boasts a separate upgrade tree which adds a new layer of strategic planning to the long-term development of your kingdom, allowing you to customize your progression based on your playstyle and requirements of the map. Kingdoms Reborn introduces a different approach to constructing your building. Instead of having everything available after you've unlocked it, every few in-game months you get a hand of cards. With random buildings and various other actions on them you have to purchase in order to then use. Some buildings like houses, bridges and storage will always be available through a separate menu but the majority of the other buildings rely on this RNG sort of system that brings in a bit of calculated chaos which you can sidestep by purchasing or later producing wild cards which will allow you to build any unlocked building at your discretion. The game also features combat but in a very simplified manner which makes even me not dislike it. Kingdoms Reborn is still in early access as of the beginning of 2023. The Wandering Village is another recent survival city builder that has not yet exited early access as of the making of this video but which definitely has the potential of becoming a sort of thematic landmark of city builders going forward. The game takes the idea of a limited surface area for development and places it on the back of a giant creature that walks through a treacherous land. As such you have to worry about the survivability of both your settlement as well as the health of the creatures whose back your settlement exists upon. This means there are several buildings and mechanics set in place for you to heal and feed the giant onbu your village sits upon. The longer the game is, the harsher the situation gets and the more careful decisions you have to make. The art style is a very cutesy cartoon sort of style which makes use of sprites and a bit of a faux 3D terrain. The more you zoom in, the more in-depth perspective you'll get. The more you zoom out, the more you'll see the movements of your onbu as well as the environment you're traversing. Patron is yet another game that can definitely trace its inspiration to Banished but with several different interesting additions, such as the different grid views which will allow you to construct your buildings and roads in a more planned manner to optimize their locations. The other major features it adds to the base Banished recipe is a research tree which will not only allow you to research new buildings but also new policies and a very active social issue layer which will be influenced by many decisions you make. One extremely neat feature in most other city building games, which Patreon has, is the ability of upgrading your production buildings. Add to these seasonal effects and an increasing population, the game tends to offer a steady supply of challenge as you go through a playthrough. The game is still being worked on and optimized as of the beginning of 2023. Cliff Empire is a survival city building game set in a very specific post-apocalyptic world. 
the Earth is covered with radioactive mist, and the survivors who escaped to live in orbit have started recolonizing the planet by inhabiting some specially engineered tall cliffs that are located above the radioactivity. This means you can only really have a limited surface area to work with on any given map and you need to find the best combination and quantity of energy producing installations to then provide your people with everything they need to be healthy, entertained and have some home furnishings. This is a sci-fi post-apocalypse, so despite the radioactive clouds blanketing the surface of the planet, people will still require a high quality of life. That being the setting though, does mean the game art is very sleek and smooth looking and from a mechanical standpoint, it does away with one of the cornerstones of city building design, roads. There are no roads in Cliff Empire, seeing as how everything is transported via drones. The game is still being updated as of the start of 2023. Caesar 1 is at the very bottom of the iceberg because even though it spawned one of the legendary classic series of city building titles, very few people are still around the community who have actually played it. And I can't really blame them, this game was released in 1992. Unless you were around back then and still are now or like me, had to use very outdated computers for the first half of the 2000s, there wouldn't be any real reason to play it. Except maybe if you had already become a big fan of the Caesar series after playing 2 or 3 and wanted to be a completionist. Because honestly the game is very much an artifact of its time. Everything it does was massively improved upon by its first sequel and then everything that sequel did was improved upon by its sequel. But that's why it's part of the iceberg at its very bottom. It started something major and industry defining. An interesting thing I noticed while making this list is how the very top and the very bottom are basically reflections of themselves, both being populated by old titles and new titles, which isn't something I was expecting really. As time passes though, I expect some of the titles on this most lower level of the iceberg to eventually rise while others to sink even lower. Now, of course, this isn't a totally comprehensive iceberg, because despite my decently large experience with city builders, I haven't played everything that ever was or ever will be, so let me know in the comments which other titles you think should be part of this iceberg, and maybe I'll get around to spotlighting them in the future. If you want to find out more about most of the titles in the video, look in the description or click on the link on the screen. I've been Stephen Nonsense, I have a Patreon, thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.